Sorry, Helen and Siobhan, I'm going to kick off now because uh, we've got 42 people uh, who've joined us already and I'm sure others can join us um, along the way. So um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Matt um, Fogarty for agreeing to join us today to deliver the Yorkshire Quality and Safety Research Group seminar. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Matt, I know Ruth and others um, on Zoom today have uh, are working with, with Matt in his capacity as Deputy Director of Patient Patient Safety Policy and Strategy for the National NHS Patient Safety Team. Um, prior to um, that title uh, and job, Matt held a number of different roles as a civil servant, including as a private secretary to the Minister of State for Health. Um, before joining the civil service, Matt was actually a research scientist and he gained his PhD in developmental neuroscience at the University College London in 2006. So as well as being having kind of a civil service background, a policy background, strategy background, Matt is also a scientist, which I think has made him an absolutely fantastic uh, collaborator with our team over a number of years. And Matt now sits on our Patient Safety Translational Research Centre Advisory Board and actually provides incredible insight into the uh, national strategy around patient safety, but is also um, amazingly supportive of the work that we and the other PS um, TLCs do. And I've known Matt for a long time now. Matt first joined me in a project to look at patient involvement in patient safety. Uh, oh, about eight years ago now, Matt, was that? Um, Something like that, yeah. It feels like a long time ago. And uh, immediately, um, his energy, enthusiasm and positivity uh, struck me. Um, and I, I felt I wanted to collaborate Matt with Matt for as long as, uh, as I possibly could. So it's great to have him here today. It's great to have him collaborating with various projects that the team um, are engaged in. And thank you again, Matt, over to you. Thank you very much. That's a really very, very kind introduction. Um, much appreciated. OK, here's the moment of truth. I am going to attempt to share the correct uh, screen and give you guys sight of the slides that I'll be going through. Uh, if somebody could tell me if that has popped up appropriately, that would be very helpful. Yes, it has. Are we in? Fabulous. We OK, um, so the first challenge is complete. So yes, I'm going to talk to you today um, for about 40 minutes or so uh, around how I feel uh, that patient safety has changed and how that change is linked to the development and the implementation of our current NHS patient safety strategy and the work that we're intending to do over the coming years to make that strategy a reality. I'm going to start by referring to uh, sort of four key thinkers uh, that uh, I've taken some inspiration or, or some insight from. Uh, these are people who've got something to say about patient safety and how it's changed over time. And then I'll link that to our current and future work um, and how we have changed our thinking on patient safety, in essence. Um, I should probably say it up front, uh, these, these are my views. I'll obviously link to the NHS England and Improvement NHS Patient Safety Strategy, but um, if I say anything controversial, it's entirely down to me. Please don't tell the HSJ. Um, <clears throat> I also need to point out as well that that behind me, um, for those of you that saw it, is a tomato plant. Um, I've had questions, I guarantee you it's a tomato plant, um, and I will just leave that there. So. Let's uh, start off where patient safety started, really, and the Hippocratic Oath. So that's the original definition of patient safety, probably. Um, I'm sure you all know it. First, do no harm. Um, so first thing to say is, did you know that Hippocrates never actually said that? Uh, the phrase, or its Greek version, um, which my pronunciation is going to ruin, but primum non nocere, or nocere, doesn't actually appear in the Hippocratic Oath. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, it's actually attributed to this guy on the right hand side, um, who's a 17th century English physician called Thomas Sydenham. But anyway, it's widely, it's widely known and fairly uh, widely quoted. And I'm afraid uh, that we probably need to dismiss it. Uh, thing is that the overwhelming evidence is that we will do harm uh, unintentionally, uh, infrequently and obviously very distressingly. But it will happen in every healthcare professional's 
career. Um, we know harm happens intentionally, um, uh, sorry, unintentionally and inevitably as a consequence of treatment. Um, but we also know that it happens unexpectedly as our systems don't deliver the outcomes that we want them to and things happen that we weren't expecting. So to talk about no harm or zero harm, as I know there's a, a significant movement behind, um, is in my view naive and is in reality unachievable. Um, another uh, significant thinker who I, I'll talk about in a minute, um, when asked this specific question, said that while zero harm is a bold and worthy aspiration, the scientifically correct goal is continual reduction. Uh, all in the NHS should understand that safety is a continually emerging property and that the battle for safety is never won, rather it is always in progress. Uh, so instead what I'm proposing is that we should look at how, what we know about harm, how it comes about and how very often we avoid it coming about and then take that insight and work with it to reduce risk. So if you do want to quote Hippocrates, uh, I quite like this second quote of his that I found online, um, science is the father of knowledge, but opinion breeds ignorance. And my first main point is therefore that we need to acknowledge that harm happens. Our role is to reduce the risk to patients and remember that risk is defined as the frequency of something happening uh, multiplied by the impact of that thing happening. For my next uh, thinker, I'd like to start with uh, what we define patient safety in the NHS. So hopefully you can all see this definition which looks familiar to you. Patient safety is the avoidance of unintended or unexpected harm during the provision of healthcare. Uh, simple? No, not really. Uh, in fact it's fraught with problems. Um, if you just take a look at that first line, unintended or unexpected harm, uh, these concepts are often conflated with an equally problematic concept of avoidable harm. How do we identify harm that is intended and that which is unintended? How do we recognize harm as opposed to the features of a disease or a condition that have led to a patient seeking help from us? Sometimes it's very obvious, uh, but there are a lot of patient safety issues where it's much less clear. Lots of safety issues exist in this kind of gray area where we can't be sure if something was truly avoidable. And part of that is because a lot of healthcare is risky and can indeed be dangerous. We use powerful drugs, we cut people open, and we're dealing with people who are vulnerable both physically and or mentally. Um, so this is where I'm gonna talk about aviation. No pres uh, safety presentation is complete without an aviation comparison. And I'm gonna argue that it's fairly tired to be honest. Um, this table, which is probably a little small for you to read, but um, I'll put the reference, um, it's from a paper by Kapoor et al. Uh, it rather neatly debunks the comparison between safety in healthcare and safety in aviation. And you can see here uh, some of the important differences between the two industries. Um, I think there are two key ones I wanna highlight. Firstly, comparison of aviation to healthcare is unfair. It's probably better to compare uh, healthcare to the whole of transport from walking all the way through to space flight. That's a fairer comparison that illustrates the breadth and range of activities that are involved in healthcare. Um, the second uh, point I'd want to make, and that's quite important for the argument I'm gonna make in a minute, is that it's fairly obvious when aviation goes wrong. Success for an airplane is the safe delivery of a group of passengers to their destination. And anything that risks that or an unexpected failure for the passengers to arrive in one piece, if you like, is a clear safety concern. In healthcare, on the other hand, if you take 200 people um, as they embark on a healthcare journey, they will all have different destinations. Some of those will be uh, death or lifelong disability or ill health, and some will involve a full recovery. But we won't know which ones uh, will have which outcomes at the start. So it's often hard to know who got to where they were supposed to go. Um, let's use an example. How do we know, for example, if a patient who has a blood clot following an operation has developed that blood clot because of their underlying medical condition, because of the impact of the surgery on their overall health, or because they missed a dose of their prophylactic anticoagulant medication? We, we simply don't know. Okay, so let's think of uh, a second person to help us illustrate this point. This is Robert Liston. Um, he's a very significant person in the history of healthcare because, uh, amongst other things, uh, he helped introduce us to the idea of anesthesia in surgery, which uh, I think we can all agree is a generally fairly good idea. Um, there's there's a, a, a book um, called Great Medical Disasters written by a guy called Richard Gordon who describes uh, Liston's 
work in quite some detail. I'm, I'm going to quote from it because um, basically the book says it better than I ever could. So apparently Liston was an incorrigible bustler, even for a surgeon. He eschewed carriages, visited his patients on horseback and loved hunting. He was six foot two and operated in a bottle green coat with Wellington boots. He sprung across the bloodstained boards upon his swooning, sweating, strapped down patient like a duelist, calling time me, gentlemen, time me to his students. Everyone swore that the first flash of his knife was followed so swiftly by the rasp of saw on bone that the sight and sound seemed simultaneous. To free both hands, he would clasp the bloody knife between his teeth. Clearly, comparisons to any current surgical staff in the NHS are to be discouraged, um, and particularly from our perspective, because he's probably the most dangerous surgeon in history. Um, this book goes on to describe Liston's most famous case as follows. He amputated the leg in under two and a half minutes. The patient died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene. He also amputated the fingers of his young assistant by accident, who also died afterwards in the ward from hospital gangrene. And he slashed through the coattails of a distinguished spectator who was so terrified that the knife had pierced him that he dropped dead from fright. This was the only operation in history that we know of with a 300% mortality rate. Imagine trying to explain that to the CQC. Um, but I don't think anyone would have expected Liston to have been arrested or even struck off at the time. His practice was considered cutting edge and the poor outcomes that he achieved were expected. In essence, the harm was expected, but it illustrates how our expectations have hopefully moved on. Um, if we think of another example, bloodletting uh, is another uh, lovely old wood cutting. Um, Bloodletting was the practice of withdrawing blood from a person's veins for therapeutic reasons. Uh, it was a kind of go-to method for any physician trying to help their patient uh, back in the day. And according to the internet, it's been around as a treatment for about 3,000 years. Uh, it looks barbaric to us, of course, uh, but at the time people genuinely believed that they were doing the right thing. So again, we have different views, albeit separated by a significant period of time about what constitutes harm. If we think about a more modern equivalent, how about stroke care? So. 30 years ago, if you had a stroke, an ambulance would uh, come and get you. We're not sure how quickly they would come and get you because it was before we started measuring and monitoring ambulance response times. But they would come and get you and they would take you to the nearest a &E for assessment uh, where you'd almost certainly be admitted and where you'd be cared for. We would all hope with the very best of intentions. Uh, if you had a bad bleed or a clot, you would probably have suffered significant disability, uh, probably for the rest of your life, really. And um, that's what happened to my grandfather. Um, I never knew him as an able man because he had a stroke just before. I was born. Uh, he could barely walk. He had uh, impaired uh, hand and arm movements, particularly down one side, and uh, problematic speech uh, until the day that he died, which was almost 20 years later. Um, if he'd had his massive stroke now and was taken to the local district general hospital and simply cared for compassionately, we would have to declare a serious incident. We would launch an investigation to try and find out what had gone wrong because he should have been taken to the nearest specialist stroke centre. He should have been given a scan when he arrived to determine the type of stroke that he'd had and then given appropriate treatment to treat the cause of that stroke, clot busting drugs, for example. Uh, ideally, and according to the standard, this would be done rapidly within four hours, ideally. Uh, in order to prevent the permanent damage to his central nervous system that he actually suffered. So within recent memory, we've got exactly the same condition, exactly the same compassion and intent to care from healthcare, but entirely different standards of care, different definitions for what is the right thing and what is the wrong thing. And we can find similar examples across healthcare. So the point I'm trying to make here is that it is not simple or straightforward to define what counts as unintended or unexpected or avoidable harm. Those concepts can actually be really unhelpful and distracting. And the examples I've used uh, don't even begin to consider how you define what is expected or unavoidable or avoidable on any particular day in any given set of circumstances. Because these can vary hugely, as you all know, in terms of staffing and patient load and all the other factors that influence healthcare. Um, even if we could pin down what we would expect or not expect on any particular day or at any one point, Progress in healthcare makes that single point in time obsolete very quickly. So here's my second point. Safety is not stable. It's a moving target. Uh, as we get better at healthcare, we actually create more ways to get things wrong, if you like, and we expand the idea of what we consider to be harm. And we also increase the expectations of what we consider safety to be. So safety cannot stand still. 
we have a it's a bit of a paradox really we expect care to be safe and to get safer but we keep moving the goalposts uh, one of the things that means is that we need to recognize that safety is a continuous process of improvement. Uh, so let's move on to uh, our third thinker. Uh, this guy you probably all recognize, uh, Don Berwick, uh, founder of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in Boston. Um, and I, again, I'm stealing shamelessly from one of Don's ideas here, which is based on a talk that I heard him give a few years ago. Uh, and in that talk, he described three eras in healthcare, three different periods of time with different ways of thinking about safety. Uh, the first era, that first period he described was that of kind of the, the village doctor, the, the Dr. Findlay type of educated gentleman, pillar of the community, uh, entirely dedicated to their patients. I mean, clearly it's not just about doctors or indeed just about men. Um, it was an era characterized by an unquestioning trust and faith in the professionalism and honor of all clinicians, but particularly doctors. Um, Society had this sort of unshakable faith uh, that these people's training and, and their kind of commitment to their uh, profession lent them a higher level of abilities than the rest of us. So in this first era, healthcare is considered entirely beneficial. Uh, we believe that its practitioners have special knowledge that's inaccessible to the rest of us. And so society as a whole kind of concedes privilege to these professionals and makes them out almost to be superhuman and therefore allows healthcare to be entirely self-regulating, um, particularly because it was felt that it had to be given that no one else could possibly understand it. But as we know, no one is superhuman, no one is infallible. So eventually we started to realize that things were not perfect in healthcare and they were going wrong. And if you look back at the 60s, 70s and the 80s, we had a variety of examples of this. We had probably the most famous, which is the thalidomide scandal. Uh, we had individual organizational problems at places like Ely and Normansfield. A little bit later, we start to get into the period of the Bristol Inquiry, Harold Shipman, Beverly Allett, and obviously more recently still, we've had Midstaff, Small Bay, and, and all the other um, examples that I'm sure you could all refer to. And society in response demanded that something had to be done. Uh, so Don described that we move into this second era of healthcare, which is characterized by a belief that the only way to ensure and assure the delivery of high quality care is to hold humans to account for their failures. Uh, we need to believe that no one will be safe unless they're effectively scared of being punished for not being safe. Uh, we start to believe that they will be safe um, and continue to get safer if we shout at them when things go wrong. We subject them to scrutiny and inspection and we measure everything that they do and every outcome that they achieve. And we kind of believe that they will only do their jobs well if we incentivize them to do their jobs well. And, you know, we create things like incentive payments. So the second area is basically a belief that it's external forces that force people to do their job better. Uh, and we've almost completely rejected this earlier notion that people have a sort of innate goodness and desire to do a good job. And there's obviously a conflict, conflict between these two areas. Uh, and I think, you know, potentially that conflict is, is in part mirrored by what people who work in and around healthcare have felt over the last decade or more. You know, this feeling of being overburdened, over scrutinized, mistrusted, and this kind of breeding of resentment. And it goes both ways. Those overseeing healthcare, so including politicians and regulators, are also sort of driven to this feeling of suspicion and um, and feeling suspicious about the system that they're overseeing, and they feel resisted and they feel sometimes helpless and, and disempowered and unable to ensure uh, high quality care is delivered. So Don argues um, that we need to move to a third era. So this is where we try and resolve the tensions uh, between these two earlier periods of healthcare. We need to um, do some of the things that uh, were characterized in both areas, but reject the poor things. So we need to measure what really matters and we need to be transparent about data. Um, really critical one is that we need to recognize that healthcare professionals are equal to patients in the pursuit of quality healthcare. No one is better than anyone else. We need to use improvement science as a core delivery process. And fundamentally, we need to reject division. It shouldn't be about managers versus clinicians or the NHS versus politicians because division is corrosive. Uh, Don told us that we needed to keep what is good about the first era and what is good about the second era. We should protect and celebrate that kind of professional pride and the commitment to science 
and the core ethos and altruism that sits at the heart of healthcare, which is about benefiting others. But we should also protect transparency and not lose sight of the fact that there does need to be accountability for the rare occasions where people behave badly through their own choices. But over everything else um, that we retain from the earlier periods, we need to put on these third era concepts. Um, so that's kind of my third point. We need to move away from um, sort of simplistic notions to a more nuanced and balanced approach. Which begs the question, what can underpin that move and help to get to this third era? Um, well, this is where I'm going to refer to Catelyn Moran, who's not normally associated with patient safety, but I think she says something quite important here. Uh, which is where she says that uh, we must recall the most important of humanity guidelines, be polite. Being polite is the, possibly the greatest daily contribution anyone can make to life on earth. That's quite a statement. Um, I think this is about, because uh, being polite is about being respectful. It says, I respect you as a fellow human being, and I recognize that you deserve courtesy as much as I deserve courtesy. And it's that respect that's the key. So thinking about patient safety, by definition, we're dealing with things going wrong, with people getting hurt, with mistakes being made, and it is perfectly normal. It is a perfectly um, predictable and acceptable human reaction to be angry or to be sad or to lose trust or to be bitter about what's happened. And we shouldn't try and change the way that people normally respond to tragedy um, because they are normal responses. What we should try and do is ensure that the system, the bit that we can control, the kind of the processes and the committees and the governance and all the other stuff that sits around harm is designed to be benign to all involved, except of course, in the tiny number of cases where it is necessary for us not to be benign. We should start from a position of respect and, and respecting that most people have good intentions and that when things go wrong, they almost certainly have gone wrong because the conditions of work have increased the chances that problems will happen. And that, of course, means that the logical response to something going wrong is to try and work out what we can do in relation to those conditions of work, i.e. the system, to reduce the likelihood of things going wrong again. Or to put it in a more positive way, to increase the chances of things going right. Um, we also, I think, uh, when considering uh, what Catelyn Moran said, reflect, um, I think we should reflect on the research evidence that we now have, which demonstrates the very immediate and acute impact that incivility and lack of politeness can have on patient safety. Uh, we, we now can see from research that when people are berated or treated poorly in the workplace, their ability to work is affected and that makes them less safe. They obsess over whatever conversation they had in which someone shouted at them or told them they weren't good enough or was frustrated with them. And while they're thinking about that, they are distracted, they are less productive, and ultimately they are less safe. Um, similarly, when people do not feel psychologically safe in their workplace, they won't be comfortable about raising concerns, they won't highlight risks, they won't challenge others uh, where they see unsafe practice, because nobody wants uh, to tell the boss that something is going wrong when the chances are that all that will happen is you get yelled at for doing so. So, <laughs> without wishing to sound trite, being nice to each other makes us all safer. So, let me summarize those points. Um, harm happens, our role is to continually reduce risk. Improving safety is tough because it's a moving target, but people's expectations rightly mean that we need to seek that kind of continuous improvement. We need to move away from simplistic notions that healthcare providers are perfect or that they will only do their jobs if we force them to and find the right balance between those two positions. And key to that balance is respect and civility and rejection of division and conflict. So what does that mean for our patient safety strategy? Well, um, those key points, I think, come together to form the two foundations that we placed at the centre of the NHS patient safety strategy, which was launched in 2019. I've highlighted them uh, in, with the red box at the bottom of this slide. Uh, those two foundations are a patient safety culture and patient safety system. Our fo uh, the focus that we have on culture, I think, reflects the importance of uh, what Don said about that third era, the third era, era even, uh, that period in healthcare where we reject division and recognize that the commitment of people who work in healthcare uh, uh, have made 
is is real and genuine and they want to deliver good quality care for their patients uh, but it also recognizes what Catelyn Moran said about respect and civility which are key to helping people perform Meanwhile, having a focus on the system does a few things. It demonstrates that we do need process, we need governance, we need assurance, planning, improvement activities, because uh, they're all key to continuously reducing risk. It also means that we're emphasizing uh, the system role in relation to the very notion of systems themselves, and particularly uh, the fact that systems in healthcare are complex. Um, and there's lots of different interactions that go on. And that's at the very heart of the challenge that we all face, but also the opportunities that we have in improving patient safety. Um, I'm not even gonna start trying to teach anyone about systems thinking or complexity theory or, or the importance of design or, or the application of human factors. Um, th those are really detailed and important concepts. Um, I will flag though that, um, those of you that aren't aware, last week the NHS patient safety syllabus was published by HE and the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, and that does cover all of those concepts and topics. And the idea there is that we will provide uh, training and education, which will um, start to come out later this summer, which will give people across the system much more understanding of these concepts and their importance. And um, I am though going to uh, sort of indulge myself by looking at a couple of examples of how our response to incidents should be based on good systems thinking and a good culture um, and how if we do that we can get a much greater understanding of how things go wrong and what we can do about them. Um, in particular what I want to focus on is how we need to improve our understanding of the complexity and kind of the, the multifactorial nature of causation in healthcare incidents and use that understanding to focus on future prevention. Um, so in that vein, I'm going to talk about everyone's favorite uh, patient safety topic, which is never events. Everyone loves a never event. Um, I want to talk about two uh, never events in particular. They're both wrong route medication never events. Um, now, some of you won't be as quite as uh, obsessed by never events as I am. Um, so let me define a wrong route medication never event for you. Um, this is an incident in which a patient is either given, um, and there are sort of three important categories. It's either uh, intravenous chemotherapy by the intrathecal route. Um, they are given oral or enteral medication or feed by any parenteral route, or it's the intravenous administration of an epidural medication that was not intended. Uh, the two examples I'm gonna talk about here relate both to the oral uh, enteral medication uh, mix up. Um, and in both the cases, actually, what I'm gonna talk about are cases in which uh, a nurse inadvertently attempted to administer Oromorph, which is an oral analgesic via an intravenous line. Uh, so it's defined nationally as a never event, principally because there are a series of controls that should be in place to prevent it from happening. Those controls include the use of these oral syringes, which you can see on the slide. Um, the key thing about these oral syringes is they're, they're not compatible with standard IV lines. Uh, so basically, they, they physically will not connect to an IV line. And the idea there is obviously that you prevent the inadvertent administration of the oral medication through that IV intravenous route. But in both the incidents that we're talking about here, that particular control was circumvented. So let me talk you through the examples. Um, in the first incident, we have a very junior nurse who couldn't find the purple oral syringes that she had been told to use to administer Oromorph. So she drew the Oromorph up in a standard syringe instead, which meant that she was able, when she went to the patient, to connect it to the patient's IV line, and she attempted to administer it. Um, those of you who've actually used Oromorph uh, will know that it's quite thick. Uh, and so the nurse quickly found that the resistance to actually administering the liquid was, was unusual. Um, that was the, the cognitive trigger, if you like, that made her realize that what she was attempting to do was the wrong thing. She immediately stopped, called her colleagues, follow-up care was provided to the patient, no long lasting harm. Let's look at our second example. So in this example, the nurse actually, um, and this is quite a surprising thing, attempted to administer the Oromorph in a purple oral syringe via the IV line. Of course, in that particular scenario, the syringe wouldn't connect to the IV line uh, because it was designed not to. When she couldn't connect it, she decanted the Oromorph into a standard IV syringe and started to administer it. So she actually circumvented the specific control that existed to prevent her from making that error. 
it was actually the point at which she noticed that a small amount of the liquid uh, had leaked onto her fingers um, and it was sticky. That was her cognitive trigger to realize that actually, gosh, what am I doing here? And similarly, she did exactly the same thing as, as the other nurse. She immediately called colleagues, uh, reported the incident and um, that the patient was cared for. And again, no long term harm. So, OK, are we talking about human error? Yeah, this is clear human error. Two nurses making the same mistake because humans are fallible and everyone makes mistakes. So let's do what we've always done. Let's send them to be retrained. You know, there's nothing like a bit of e-learning or a few hours in a lecture theater to make someone a lot safer. Um, or I know, let's uh, get them to do some reflective practice. And um, you know, we put our children on the naughty step and we send them to their rooms to think about what they've done. Why wouldn't that work for highly skilled professionals? Um, or the third thing you know, that we often do is we must share the learning and what's better for that than making a warning poster. Uh, I don't know about you guys, I always take the time to read the 47 different posters that are on the wall in the room before I do anything. Um, I know you're going to all recognize those strategies and I know you're all going to recognize that they fail on various counts. Um, the biggest failure, of course, is that they assume that the last person to touch the patient was the problem. Uh, secondly, the, they assume that the problem is the same across the both incidents uh, and of course they're all fairly weak interventions in their own right actually they're not identical incidents at all i know they said they shared lots of similar uh, features but what happened in both cases was very different with a range of contributing factors um so let's go back to the incidents in the first one uh, this is the one with the relatively junior uh, nurse who couldn't find any oral syringes what we found during the investigation was that this nurse, relatively inexperienced, had no idea that an oral syringe was specifically designed not to connect to an IV line or that that purple color was designated for oral medication. She'd never been told why purple syringes were purple or, or how they were distinct from other types of syringes. So when she found herself without any purple syringes because the stock control system had not worked properly, i.e. there were not enough syringes on the ward, she worked around the problem to ensure that her patient got the pain relief that she needed. She compensated. She did the thing that she thought she was supposed to do in order to provide good care. And her good intentions, combined with the other contributory factors, such as the stock control problem, created the potential for the incident to happen. Uh, so let's look at a way of thinking about this. Um, this is uh, on this slide that hopefully you can all see. This is a conceptual framework for classifying different types of error, which was created by a guy called James Reason. Um, he also invented the Swiss cheese model, which I'm sure you've probably heard of. Um, <clears throat> if you look at Reason's model for classification of error, um, you could think about how we would classify this first mistake. Um, and I would suggest that what uh, that nurse did was a knowledge based mistake. It wasn't the only problem, of course, and please don't think that I'm suggesting it was all based on this, but clearly there was a strong contribution from the fact um, that the ward had run out of oral syringes and, and there was no one else around to help the nurse out. So those things are really important as well. But we can see that part of the problem was a lack of knowledge on the part of that individual nurse about the purpose of the purple syringes that she'd been told to use. Um, the other incident involved a very senior nurse. Uh, she knew exactly what a purple syringe was for. She knew why it was important. She taught other nurses about why it was important. She'd used them for years. So what had gone wrong there? Well, when she talked about what she did that night, she couldn't explain it. She had administered this, uh, this medication many times. Um, but this time she didn't do it properly. And afterwards, when she was asked why, she couldn't for the life of her understand how she'd made such a basic mistake. But crucially when she was telling people about the incident she also told them that earlier in that day she'd received some very distressing news and she'd been thinking about that all day and was very distracted by it so when you combine the fact that it was late at night and there was a lack of other staff around um to help her out it was her distraction that was a critical factor in what she did her head was you know effectively spinning with the news that she'd received and she was probably acting on autopilot so we classify this as a slip. It's an attentional failure. It's um, it's an unintended um, action. What's the point in me suggesting that we classify these actions or incidents? And uh, the point is because it helps us think through what we need to do in response. I please don't think that I'm ignoring the fact that there are multiple factors involved here. Um, but we can see that there are some key things that we might want to do. In the first incident, 
relatively junior nurse, didn't know why a purple syringe was purple. That suggests there's a problem with staff understanding of existing safety measures. So clearly we should start by asking other nurses, do you guys know why these syringes are purple? Has anyone taught you about these safety interventions, why they exist? What other safety strategies do we have in place that we've never actually explained to anybody? Should we do something about induction or uh, training to consider whether or not we can increase people's knowledge of the reason that sits behind the safety intervention? And of course, let's look at staffing levels. Let's look at stock management. Let's think about all the other ways that we can avoid a similar situation arising. With the second nurse, training's entirely pointless. She knows, she's trained other people. There, there is absolutely no point in under training, undertaking training with that individual. And there's no problem with stock here either because she was using a, a, an oral syringe and then changed what she was doing. In that case, um, the investigator that looked at this in detail recommended that what the organization needed to do was to consider strategies that would encourage staff to flag if there was a reason why they may need additional support on a shift. Uh, so for example, if they'd not had enough sleep or they'd received uh, upsetting news and that crucially that something was done in relation to the culture of the organization so that we could be sure that it's an organization within which if somebody did raise their hand and say, my head's in the wrong place today, that information would be treated responsively and positively so that in the future, if someone was fundamentally distracted, there's a chance that the organization might be able to help them out instead of putting their man patients at risk. So these examples illustrate why we need to um, employ people who understand safety science to examine incidents in order to work out why something has gone wrong so that we can then take the most appropriate action to reduce risk. There is no point in sending someone for retraining if the reason they made a mistake is because they were distracted. And there is no point in emphasizing adherence to a protocol or a policy if people are routinely violating the existing policy because it is not practical to deliver. So in these examples, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, understanding how to reduce risk, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, requires this sort of sensitive and supportive work with the staff involved using good investigation, good understanding of systems and human factors and error theory. And in both cases, it was vital, absolutely vital that the staff felt safe to fully explain the situation they'd faced so that the incident could be understood. And in both cases, the proposed improvements require an understanding of the wider implications of the risks, careful change management and an approach to risk reduction based on quality improvement science. I'm going to ask you to indulge me for one more example, um, which is another way of thinking about error and incidents. I, I flagged that the taxonomy of unsafe acts is, is a way of thinking about safety, but it has been criticized for being quite linear. Um, and um, actually there's a growing recognition that incident causation is usually quite complex. And it's unusual for there to be that sort of one root cause. And we should try and be less linear in our thinking about this. Um, the linear thinking has been a uh, likens to thinking about dominoes, you know, simple cause and effect, uh, linking one event to the next. But systems thinking encourages us to think more like Jenga. Uh, hopefully that's fairly easy to understand metaphor. In Jenga, while it's clear which was the last block to be removed, which caused your tower to fall over and your kids to laugh at you because you're rubbish at the game, actually, it was all the blocks that you removed earlier that created the conditions for the tower to come down. And they're as important in creating the instability as the last block to be removed. And that's a, that's a better metaphor for what happens in actual incidents than that simple domino effect. Um, my last example uh, came up when we were talking to an organization that we're working with who are looking to try and change their approach to incidents. <clears throat> And they want to focus more on systems and learning. So they gave us an example of moving from simply looking at that proximal cause to considering the whole incident and all its contributory factors and then thinking, how can we solve this? Uh, the incident they told us about uh, related to a trauma patient who was brought into ED in a very bad way. Um, she required urgent transfusion. But inadvertently, she was given rhesus incompatible blood in the ED. And this, this organization, they examined this event and they found that there had been various issues involved. Uh, there were issues to do with the ordering of the blood by a telephone. Um, there were problems with checking the order back. There were problems with checking it against the stock with the actual process of collecting the blood from the blood bank and transporting it across the hospital. Uh, Cause obviously the blood's kept a long way away from ED and then the issues with checking when they were administering it to the patient. There were loads of points that could have been described as 
human error again. Um, for example, the porter selecting the wrong blood. Somebody else didn't have their bleeper on, which meant that they had to find another way of getting hold of the right stuff. But instead of thinking about the issue through a human error lens and considering how to change each of the policies and procedures to address each of the problems that led to the incident, the organization kind of took a step back and they thought about how do we stop it from happening again? So they put a new blood fridge in ED. Instead of looking at each of the errors involved in the process of ordering, selecting, checking, transporting, and delivering blood from elsewhere in the hospital, and trying to make each of those individual steps better or less risky, they got rid of the whole process and put the blood in the emergency department. Instead of trying to stop people from making mistakes, they asked, what is the solution? And then they put the solution in place. So what does that mean for our strategy? Well. We believe that the point of the strategy is to bring together a focus on culture and an understanding of the importance of systems with a much more evidence-based and effective understanding of safety. So we have our insight strand of the strategy, which is where we're trying to improve the way that we record information about incidents that's much more suited to our understanding of what went wrong rather than just what the outcome was. We're also encouraging people to make more intelligent use of incident data, including through approaches like machine learning to try and enhance our understanding of the problem. Um, some of you will be aware that we are trialing a replacement for the current serious incident framework. And that's all about emphasizing the importance of systems thinking, human factors, and delivering real sustainable reduction in risk, moving away from that kind of linear and mechanistic and repeated investigation of incidents over and over again without making change. Um, I've already mentioned that we are uh, intending to empower and involve people by supporting patient safety training and education um, and the safety syllabus that was published last week is a critical part of that. We've also created this new role of patient safety specialists to recognize that there is an expertise and an importance of safety leaders in the NHS. Uh, safety is not easy, it's not intuitive and we deserve experts in patient safety to lead the improvement that we need. Um, we're also launching a framework for involving patients in patient safety, both in their own safety and as safety leaders supporting trusts. And this is remembering what Don said about healthcare professionals and patients being equal in the pursuit of good quality healthcare. And <clears throat> at the sharp end, uh, we are continuing to support safety improvement in key areas. So we've got our medication safety improvement program, mental health safety improvement, maternity and uh, work to avoid, uh, or sorry, prevent avoidable deterioration. And it's uh, the use of evidence-based solutions, again, using quality improvement methodologies to tackle problems rather than just trying to make existing risks marginally less risky. And the last thing I would say is there is no quick fix to this. And this is going to require sustained effort for years, but we are optimistic that the work that we're doing now will enable the NHS to continuously improve safety for our patients and, of course, to reduce harm for years to come. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, what, a, what an insightful talk that made a huge amount of sense to me. Uh, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Um, do we have questions um, from the floor? Please, if you don't want to kind of put your hand up and say them out loud, pop them in the chat and uh, I'll pick them, Helen or I'll pick them up from there. But if you do have a question that you want to direct to Matt, please go ahead. I've got a comment. Thank you. A really nice potted history of safety there too. Um, I think I'll kick off then um, while people have a think about what they might want to ask. So, um, Matt, you talked um, a lot about safety as we know it in terms of um, the kind of errors that, and, and violations that might occur. And uh, I was really interested to see that framework from Reason because I did my PhD was developing the violation categories in that framework. So uh, it was good to see my uh, categories of violations uh, <laughs> appearing in that in that document. Jim, Jim Reason was my supervisor and what a fantastic uh, supervisor he 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 was. Um, such a such an inspired thinker. Uh, so really interested to see that and see the way that you're approaching and thinking about um, errors and how they occur and the, 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 the background to them and the complexity of, of um, errors 
the complexity of how errors happen, but also the complexity of the systems in which they're happening. So that, that kind of sophisticated approach is, is really good to see. When you speak to patients about what patient safety means to them, they often refer to um, feeling safe. I just mm -hmm. I feel safe here or I don't feel safe here. Um, and although that is sometimes related to, you know, you know, whether they're be being given medicines at the right time and um, whether they feel they're being looked after properly. It, it's often a lot to do with the kind of relationships that they formed with the people caring for them. So I wondered what your view or perspective was on safety being a bit much broader concept, which does include kind of compassionate care and forming those really strong relationships with healthcare professionals. Do you do you uh, adopt that that view within the work that you're doing, Matt, or do you tend to stay fairly kind of technical about uh, patient safety? Uh, that's a yeah. Th there's a real challenge in that because, um, as is as is the way with with large organisations and and a sort of national functions, particularly one that I work in, you do have to have a um, you have to draw boundaries around what you do effectively so that you can be clear about whose job is this and 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 whose job is that and and that you know the queries go to the right place and the responsibility is done by the right people and you don't have overlapping uh duplicative or sometimes even obviously um uh, non uh inconsistent approaches to things so we do have to kind of draw some boundaries around stuff um and so that does lend itself to a slightly more technical approach but um i, I think one of the things that we have genuinely tried to do and we are we're really focusing hard on in the national team is is to take a more um a more cultural approach to safety as well which i think starts to bring in some of those issues uh, that i highlighted around around compassion around relationships around uh, the human side of what we do you know healthcare is um is fundamentally a human activity it's about people yeah we lose lots of tech and there's lots of science involved and that's great and that's to be honest that's where my bias is towards i'm i am i am a more technical person you flagged at the beginning i used to be a scientist that's that's kind of how my brain works um but if we don't recognize the human side, we won't succeed because it isn't it isn't a recipe. There isn't just a list of instructions you can follow. It is all about uh, humanity and relationships. Uh, it's one of the things that I, it's almost the strongest um, lesson from the last 12 months has been that everything uh, sinks or swims on the basis of individuals talking to each other. It's that human relationship that has made some of our responses to the COVID pandemic work because it's it's people working with each other and helping each other so yeah i think it has to be a fundamental part of it thanks matt so getting some really um nice comments in the in the chat as well so thank you so much for the syllabus for the talk and for the syllabus that was re released last week just wanted to feedback how useful this is from a higher education perspective um, as I've been trying to implement, implement more of this info into teaching, um, but some academics that haven't been in clini clinician, clinical roles for a long time and still clinging on to an older safety culture. So really, really good to hear that feedback. Um, and then a question here from Jane. Um, how do we, so Jane Ahara, who you know, how do we support people to move away from the framing of zero harm and never events and think more about emergence of error in complex systems? um yeah it, i mean that is that is tricky uh not least because you know I, I am still responsible for a policy area called the never events framework which does take a fairly um blunt view of of issues like preventability and avoidability which i've clearly just described in a way that uh, suggests that i don't necessarily subscribe to that view um as with a lot of things, you need to recognize the reality of the position that we find ourselves within, which is where, you know, like it or lump it, there is a, um, a tendency to see things as black and white. That's easier for people to grasp. Uh, it's entirely understandable. We all do it. Um, we particularly do it in areas that we don't really understand. You know, we're all very good at making judgments about areas of the world that we're not experts in, in black and white terms. And it's only when we become more expert in something that we realize how little we know and how difficult it is. Um, I think it's it's one of, for me, it's one of the main motivations behind this real focus on 
people and giving them skills and the training and education and also recognizing the expertise that's necessary in this area because one of the one of the reasons that we we were keen on this um, as part of the strategy development was work that we'd done in the preceding years to go out and talk to people and understand what they understood about safety and realizing that you know very often we put people um, who are brilliant clinicians in the position of management who are brilliant managers in the position of managing safety assuming they can do it why do we make that assumption why do we assume people understand this complex technical area um just because they're good at something else actually no let's train and uh, so i think one of the keys to answer jane's question is um is to give people more of an understanding of, of the the complexity that's involved through training and education so that they realize themselves that yes okay we, we you know we have a never events framework but if you if you read carefully what it says it is trying to find that nuance it is pointing out that you know what there are a whole bunch of things that we should all have done because we've all been told to do it and there's clear evidence that it works and a lot of the time when things have not gone to plan it's because we haven't actually done those things that we we're told to do um i mean hsj did a report a couple of days ago i don't know why i keep plugging hsj but anyway um a record a couple of days ago on the fact that we're consulting on uh, a new alert around uh, misconnection of air and oxygen lines uh, and removing uh, airflow meters to prevent that from happening and in part that's because we put out an alert saying please stop using these things please take them away and actually it wasn't done to the level of fidelity that we would want uh, and actually in in that scenario it, it is it is a clear and obvious solution to um to a to a risk with other scenarios some of the other never events they are less uh clear-cut and there are obvious things that can go wrong that can degrade the the effectiveness of the controls that we try and put in place uh, and we're looking at that as well it's worth flagging that and um, you know we recently removed the extraction of the wrong tooth from the never events list because the controls that are in place don't work as well in that scenario because you've got um you know people have a very variable um uh teeth uh the, you know the, the the physiology of the mouth is is quite variable between different patients so the nomenclature is non-standard the recognition of the right site and the wrong site is non-standard you can't mark teeth like you can mark other um operating sites and uh mainly the only person that can see what they're doing is the operator the surgeon uh, which means that there's fewer vis um, visual checks from others in the room that the right site is being operated on. All of those things, you know, kind of have a, a cumulative effect and degrade the controls, meaning that that's less of a preventable thing. Hence, it's uh, been removed from the list. Thanks, Matt. And what you seem to be describing there is instances where absolute reliability is what we're looking for and other instances where there is the need for kind of flex flexibility and adaptation to local circumstances. So, um, Really nice question from Lizzie here. So um, she thanks you for your presentation, Matt. Um, I wonder how we can explain to patients that risk is inherent in healthcare and how do we manage expectations? <laughs> it's a great question, Matt, Lizzie. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a fab question. So uh, you can take it at two levels. Um, I, I'm, I have thought about this. I, I think it's still up for debate, but personally, I'm not a huge fan of the idea that we try and educate the entire population in terms of how dangerous healthcare is. I'm not convinced that will do anything other than scare people who are liable to be scared and the rest of the world will just ignore us because people aren't interested. Um, I do think there is a really important role uh, for us as healthcare professionals to support patients to understand at the point at which they're accessing care what they can do to help and what that means in relation to the risks that exist. So um, one of the things that our framework for involving patients in patient safety will do, um, it's due to be published relatively shortly, is to emphasize the importance of involving patients themselves in that risk mitigation at the point at which they're in receipt of healthcare. So, you know, encouraging people to ask questions about, well, why am I having this medication? Um, should I still be having this medication? Um, how long will I have it for and when should I stop? Should I ask you, should I stop it? Or are you gonna tell me when I should stop it? You know, just opening up that conversation so that people have um, an ability to, to help 
add to the risk mitigation strategies that we already have. I think that's absolutely vital. I don't think it's it's necessarily a matter of um, you know scaring people with horrendously high numbers of or have you any idea how risky it is to be involved in healthcare. Uh, but I think most people will accept that you know medications are not entirely benign. They can have side effects. I think you know actually again COVID has demonstrated um, a, a need. And I think society has got more um, interested in and understanding of the balance of risk. You just look at the, you know, the debate that's been ongoing around vaccination side effects. How many people can you talk to now who suddenly start talking knowledgeably about the the, the risk profile of a COVID vaccine versus the risk profile of uh, the contraceptive pill, for example? You know, people suddenly knowledgeably talking about the, the risk factors involved in having a blood clot from one versus a blood clot from the other. That's all about risk and public understanding of risk has been enhanced by this last 12 months. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, I think we might have time just for one more question. And I'm not sure that we could do this justice in two minutes, but if you could maybe just give a fairly high level answer. This is a question from Isabel about um, thoughts on patient safety for marginalised groups. There's obviously a no one size fits all. And we've heard in the media over the past few weeks about, um, you know, differential treatments for patients from different uh, groups. Does um, does the NHS safety team have a particular uh, view or do you have a particular view on how we can impact patient safety for marginalised groups? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wouldn't have expected you all to read it, but you should now. Um, the update to the strategy that we published in February. So we committed when we first published that we would annually or thereabouts. Um, review and revise what the strategy committed us to do um, and so the latest one of those was published in February of this year and in that um, one of the big changes that we made was to in, uh, include a whole work stream around safety inequalities um, looking at all aspects of inequality across uh, the safety arena um, going through that and I mean clearly that was obviously prompted by the events with COVID and the, the, the unequal distribution there but also the the um, uh, obviously, the events that happened in, in America um, and with uh, the recognition of, of that sort of embedded inequality. Um, looking at that challenge illustrated clearly to us, firstly, that we didn't have enough information. Um, there are very clear uh, um, areas of evidence and information that demonstrate health inequalities within our system. COVID's one of them, uh, but you know that there are all kinds of different um, uh, evidence bases that demonstrate that people, say, from um, people with different sexuality, um, feel less trust and uh, are treated differently um, to other members of society. Um, there was the, um, the clear evidence presented by Baroness Cumberledge in her review last year uh, that. Uh, where women access healthcare and report, say, pain, they are treated differently to when men access healthcare and report pain. Um, similarly, we know that men don't access healthcare, uh, at least not to the extent that uh, women do, and you know, kind of do the suffer in silence and, and the sort of typical masculine thing, uh, which can have impacts, uh, particularly in mental health. Um, so there's lots and lots of evidence around that. What we don't have is great evidence around uh, unequal impact in terms of safety specifically. So one of the things that we've committed to do is do a lot more evidence generation and gathering around that to really understand the problem. We think there is a problem. Um, what we can't do is articulate exactly what it looks like and exactly what sits behind it. And obviously for you know reasons I've just spoke about for the last hour, we're quite keen to understand what sits behind it so that what the interventions that we put in place, we can have a level of confidence that they'll they'll make a difference. Um, one of our um, team has actually, it was this week, published a blog um, on the NHS providers uh, website, which describes his work to examine the issue of um, inequalities in patient safety. He's, he's come up with a, a kind of categorization of the different places where patient safety may be impacted. Um, that includes things like access, but it includes issues around communication and challenges of communication. It includes differences in cultural understanding of, of different elements. And um, so it's very much well worth a read if you just Google uh, Key and Wade uh, 
NHS providers and safety inequalities, it should pop up. Um, so yeah, very much worth, uh, well worth looking at that. And it's an area that we need to explore much more. We're going to be doing research. Uh, we use, we're trying to improve the, as I've said, the data collection in our incident reporting systems. Um, and also asking all of our programs to explicitly consider the inequalities agenda, um, which is more obvious in some places than in others. And another obvious example that must be mentioned um, is the, um, the disparity in maternal mortality between um, women from a black and minority ethnic background and white women. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on that led by our chief midwife. So yeah, lots going on, uh, but lots more to do. Well, that's an excellent place to finish. Thank you, Matt. There's um, a, a lot of love in the chat for the, uh, for the presentation and a great deal of interest in what you've talked about today, Matt. So I'd just like to take this last opportunity to say thank you very much. We can all give you a round of applause um, and uh, really appreciate you taking the time today. That's oh, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.